Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If this is your very first time checking into my videos, then welcome. Make sure you subscribe down below to join the crew. And if this is your 5th, 11th time checking into one of my videos, then thank you for your continued support. I love you. So today's video, as you can see from the title below, is about how to build a natural hair care regimen. Sis, you're going to take the mystery out of your natural hair care routine. No more guessing what products will or won't work. No more guessing how to apply your product, how to get the most out of your style, and how to keep your hair lasting longer. So, without further ado, grab your popcorn, grab your snacks, grab a notebook and some paper, some pens, whatever you need to take notes because I'm about to drop some knowledge on you sis and so let's just get started so let's talk about curl shape this is what we're all familiar with the hair typing system that starts at 1a goes all the way to 4c this is what your hair looks like um, but it doesn't really tell you much about the proper protein moisture balance what products will and will not work for you and how to retain that growth that you get But it does teach you what your hair looks like, which helps you learn to love your own hair texture, which is a lot of the obstacle when it comes to uh, growing our natural hair, not comparing it to others. So in some way, it's the least important when it comes to actually taking care of our natural hair. But on the other end, it's very helpful to know what our hair looks like so we can find inspiration from others that have a similar hair pattern and know that our hair can grow and flourish and just learn to love our hair. But when it comes to building your natural hair regimen, the way your hair looks is probably the least important, which is why you may watch a YouTuber's video in frustration because their hair looks just like yours, but the products that they use and the methods that they use simply don't work. But let's move on to the next factor. The second factor is strand thickness. So when I say strand thickness, I mean fine, medium, coarse. And that's gonna deal with the actual thickness of each of your individual strands. So, you may know what your curls look like and how they clump and things like that. But what you're looking at is obviously a curl group. These strands just happen to grow out of your scalp with the similar shape. So when you style them, they clump together. But within that curl group, there are individual strands. And you can barely see mine because I have fine hair. But the actual thickness of those strands is going to play into how you take care of your hair. Another thing to consider is that if you have tightly curly, kinky, coily hair, you can almost assume that your hair is fine at some point. And let me explain that. The way that your hair curls, your actual curl pattern, is physically determined by the shape and the size of your hair follicle. If you have kinky or really curly hair, then the shape of your hair follicle is flatter and thinner. As a rule of thumb, the tighter and kinkier your hair is, the more fine your strands are. And it has been shown by putting, you know, textured hair under a microscope that the strand thickness actually varies along the length of curly hair. So your hair strand may start like this at the root and then it will shrink and get bigger and it varies along the strand and those thin points are each points of a twist or turn in your curl well that means that the tighter and coilier curlier your hair is the more points of high risk breakage you have so you have to be especially gentle with your hair 
and you have to make sure that your hair has a proper moisture protein balance which we're going to get into more depth of um, when we talk about porosity but that just shows you how fragile your hair is and the importance of being gentle this is why a lot of natural hair women or women with curly hair opt to use fewer tools in their hair so nothing that's going to catch or snag on their strands because our hair is more prone to breaking along those those thinner points along the hair strand. Strand thickness is actually more complicated than you think. It's actually inherited. You may naturally have more cuticle layers. So if we're talking about the structure of the hair, the outermost layer is kind of like shingles on a roof, the way that it's like scales that lay on top of one another. And you may have more or less layers depending on the texture of your hair and heredity. So if your hair is straight, you more likely have more layers of um, the cuticle than someone who has finer strands. That means that if you have fewer cuticle layers to start off with, then that means you're more prone to getting damaged easier. Whereas someone who has straight hair could bleach their hair, and although it may deplete uh, an entire cuticle layer on their hair they may have five or six more to go through so their hair may still appear and behave healthily while you with kinkier or coarse or with kinkier um, more curly strands may find that bleaching your hair does irrevocable damage to your hair um, because you only have one to five cuticle layers to burn through before your hair is utterly damaged so these are things that we need to consider as well. So strand thickness depends on just the actual texture of your hair, the cuticle layers that you have, but it also depends on the damage that you've done to it because you can damage your cuticle layer. If you have fine strands, which again, if you have tightly textured hair or highly textured hair, I would go ahead and assume that you have medium to fine strands then I would opt for products that are lighter. And I'm not saying products that don't have shea butters and, and rich ingredients and things like that, but I'm saying products that really melt into the strands are gonna be the best for your hair without, so that it doesn't weigh it down. Lighter products for finer hair heavier products for heavier products for medium and coarse more coarse hair now i know that we've heard this mix up between coarse versus thick so when someone says coarse you automatically think kinky texture but what coarse really describes is the thickness of your strands so you can have coarse hair and have straight hair. This is someone who has coarse straight hair. This is an example of someone who has coarse curly hair. You see how they look different, but it's not exactly what you would explain as coarse. You wouldn't exactly describe this as coarse. That's just the difference between the terms. You may describe naturally Timmy as having thick hair but in reality she has fine strands that are dense and so thickness of your strands ties right into the next topic which is density so the best way to describe density is by looking at a grid so I have three pictures here there is low medium and very or high density and density just describes how many literal strands grow out of your scalp within a certain area. So you can have fewer strands, you can have somewhere in the middle, and then you can have a lot of strands that grow in a, any given area of your scalp. And this again is hereditary completely. You can have fine straight hair, you can have dense straight hair, you can have low density kinky hair, you can have high density kinky hair. And like I mentioned before, your hair can be fine and dense. And this is what, in common conversation, we will refer to as thick. Like again, Naturally Timmy has very fine strands but dense hair. While Charmzy, for example, 
has medium to fine strands and low density hair. So these are all things that are gonna play into mostly how you style your hair and how much product you use. And as you may assume, the lower your density is, the less product you want to use. While the more dense your hair is, the more product you're gonna need to make sure that you're coating all of your strands. Density also plays into styling. If you are going for, and also, you know, this depends on your desired look, but if you're going to go for definition, you're gonna to want to work with more sections if your hair is dense. Where if you have low density hair, you can get away with fewer sections or whatever the case may be and still get tons of definition because you just have fewer strands on your head. And so if your hair is low density, you can see your scalp without manipulation. So while your hair is wet, you can see your scalp right through your hair. And when you go to style it, you still can see your scalp. That just means you have low density hair. If you have dense hair, your hair is difficult to part. You almost can't even see the part when you do part your hair. And you just, you know you need many sections um, when you're styling. So medium, of course, falls somewhere in the middle. I would describe my hair as medium, simply because I don't have to do tons of sections, but I do have to do more sections than someone with low density hair. Also, I'm not rocking a part today, but if I was to part my hair, it's not difficult. You can see my scalp when I do that. So I wouldn't consider my hair to be incredibly dense for that reason. So the next thing I want to talk about is something that I think gets overlooked when we're talking about our hair regimen, and that is scalp health. So let's get into it. Your scalp structure is very intricate. You have your actual follicle, which again, the size and shape of this follicle will determine the actual curl pattern of your hair. But as you see, there's also sweat glands that are separate from the follicle, and there's sebaceous glands where our natural sebum is created, and then there's blood vessels which bring the nourishment to our scalp. But it's crucial to address any scalp issues or ailments that you are currently experiencing because that is the very place from whence your hair grows. Yes, I did use the word whence. <laughs> But why am I saying that? Well, your hair, as when it comes out of your scalp, is dead. The cells that make up your hair are only alive and thriving within your actual scalp. Those cells are called keratinocytes because they are cells that produce keratin. So they build the strands from the inside and once they leave out of the scalp, they die and they, they keep their keratin uh, protein structure. And so what you're seeing here, what grows out of your hair and what you actually see is a result of your actual scalp health, how you're taking care of your scalp. So that's where scalp massages come into play. That action of putting your, your, the pads of your fingers on your scalp and rubbing it there warms up the scalp and sends, warms up the scalp and encourages circulation to the area. So how often should we do scalp massages? Whenever you have time, sis, when I'm bored or when my head itches, instead of scratching it, I've tried to replace that habit with massaging my scalp. And A, it relieves the itch still, and B, it doesn't cause those micro abrasions that happen when you use your nails to scratch your scalp, um, which can, do really bad damage to your scalp, so try to prevent from doing that. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, sis, okay? I'm the main person that needs to be telling yourself that. But incorporate those scalp massages just whenever you get bored, whenever you feel an itch, just massage the area, and I guarantee that you're gonna see, you're gonna feel the difference in your scalp over time. Now when it comes to using oils on your scalp, I have a very unpopular opinion about it. 
I for one don't like using just any oil on my scalp. I'm not gonna go down the kitchen, you know, cooking aisle and just pick up an olive oil or a coconut oil straight off the shelf simply because I think there's a reason why um, oils have to be um, synthesized in such a way that they're useful for the hair. Just because your scalp and your hair have a specific pH and you don't want to put anything on your scalp that is going to disrupt that pH because sometimes scalp ailments, um, dandruff, itching, irritation, are a result of a pH imbalance on the scalp. So the last thing you want to be doing is causing a pH imbalance by just throwing anything on your hair. Not that I'm not that I'm against oils because there are great oils out there, but just make sure that what you're using is actually made for your hair and scalp. And also consider using scalp treatments. Uh, it may not be 100% oil, but these things have uh, ingredients in it like salicylic acid that are gonna kill bacteria and um, just things that lower the pH to match the pH of your scalp. And that's inevitably just gonna help your scalp produce its own natural sebum as it should. Now, I, like I said, I do incorporate scalp massages a lot more often now, but here's a fun fact, right? So not only do massages bring back, you know, bring circulation to your scalp where it otherwise would not have that circulation, but it also helps evenly spread the sebum around your scalp. Did you know that if you have a dry scalp, that may be due to uneven production of sebum on your scalp? What does that mean? This area may produce a ton of sebum, but this area does not. While this area does, and this area does, and nowhere else does. So uh, massaging your scalp is, is going to circulate that sebum around the, the entire surface area of your scalp to kind of like spread the wealth because the best oil for your hair to lubricate your strands and encourage that, you know, the continual health of your hair is gonna be your natural sebum. With scalp health and all the topics that we're gonna talk about later on, you wanna address your issues with your shampoo and conditioners. So, if, you're, if you have a dry scalp which leads to dandruff, make sure you're looking for a dry scalp shampoo. You have to be careful with dandruff because dandruff can be caused by several different things. If you know that your scalp is just incessantly dry, then you need to look for a shampoo that says for treatment of dandruff caused by dry scalp. Because dandruff can also be caused by an oily scalp and overproductive sebaceous glands. You don't wanna use that shampoo for your dandruff if that's not the cause of your dandruff. And it also, again, can be caused by pH balance. So if you find that your hair is not necessarily dry, not necessarily oily, but it's just flaky, try to let your hair breathe from those grocery aisle oils you're putting on your hair. And just incorporate scalp massages and see that you don't see a difference. Now, if you have a severe condition on your scalp, I'm talking about scalp psoriasis or seboric dermatitis. I don't know if I said that right. Or seboric dermatitis. Please make sure that you're going to a, a dermatologist, a professional, to seek advice on what to do for your hair. So let's make sure that we're incorporating scalp health into our healthy hair regimen. The most important factor I have talked about yet is porosity. Now, I know you've probably heard of this now, it's been circulating around, but you can have low, medium, or high porosity. Now, as I mentioned before, you have cuticle layers um, in your hair structure, right? That's the very outer layer of your hair that lay on top of one another like shingles on a roof. So if your hair is untreated, like it is virgin, you don't even put, you don't use any direct heat and you don't use any color, you literally just rock your hair in its natural state 
then you most likely have low porosity hair. And this is regardless of your hair texture. That's whether you have kinky hair, that's whether you have the straightest hair. If your hair is unprocessed, you have low porosity hair, most likely. And what that means is that ain't nothing getting in, ain't nothing getting out, okay, without a little bit of help. So it also means that you need to use that heat is gonna be your friend. And when I say heat, I mean indirect heat, which I'm meaning like blow dryers and uh, bonnet dryers, you know, the hooded dryers. Those are gonna be your best friend. If you spend five to 10 minutes just standing in the shower, waiting on your hair to get wet before you shampoo it, you probably have low porosity hair. If when you get out the shower, your hair is soaking wet, but it looks dry, you probably have low porosity hair. If you put products on your hair and it just look like it's sitting on top of your hair, since you have low porosity hair. If the shrinkage ain't never been realer, <laughs> you might have low porosity hair. I'm gonna put out a video following this one on how to build your low porosity hair regimen step by step. If you have high porosity, this is just how you would describe hair that is damaged. Most likely, your hair is high porosity because you damaged it, sis. You damaged it, all right? So if you have high porosity hair, that means that your strand, your cuticle layers are wide open, sis. That means stuff that melts into your hair. It can be the heaviest product, it'll just uh, suck up all the moisture. But within a few days, within a couple days, two or three days, your hair is thirsty yet again. So you have to incorporate techniques that encourage your cuticle to close. I'm also gonna have a how to build a high porosity regimen video coming up after this as well, so stay tuned for that. In the middle is medium porosity hair. So medium porosity hair is kind of like the ideal. The strands, the cuticles lay relatively flat, but they're not so flat that they can't allow things in, and they're not so open Open that all the moisture just evaporates out. It's kind of like a happy medium. It's an ideal porosity to have. And you'll find that in the medium and low, the high and low um, porosity regimens, that what you're really trying to do is bring your hair porosity to where it's kind of floating and behaving like medium porosity hair would do. How do you know you have medium porosity hair? Well, medium porosity hair is kind of like you have a proper balance. Like your hair may not be completely virgin, but you take it easy on the process and you may process your hair one to two times a year, um, three max. And so you're not over manipulating your hair, but your hair may not be perfectly virgin either, but you just have found a very happy medium. You found a good balance of processing versus letting your natural hair just flourish. So I'm also gonna put a regimen for um, medium porosity hair up as well, so keep watching. Now, let me say this right now. The float test is not accurate. I don't care, like I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And it's not a, a reproducible way and it's not a reproducible way to get results. It's just not, it's pseudoscience, honestly. So the way to know what your porosity, your porosity is, is just by the way that your hair behaves. So once you've determined based on the way that your hair behaves, whether you have high, medium, or low, porosity then make sure that you uh, watch the videos to come next about how to outline a regimen based on your porosity the last topic which is kind of like an added bonus is gonna be your desired look guys once you decide what you're going for when you're styling your hair is going to determine what type of products you use and what techniques are going to be the best for you for example, if you're going to be applying heat to your hair, you're not going to use the same products that you use on your hair in its natural state. You're going to want to have some type of product that has a heat resistance to it. Silicones are widely used in the hair world to 
help with heat styling. And that's because they provide this almost plastic-like barrier to make your hair, to protect your hair from excessive heat. And they're also going to provide a moisture barrier to lock in the moisture that you put in your hair, but also keep the moisture from the atmosphere from penetrating into your strands. So if you're doing heat styles, you're going to want to incorporate a line of products that are going to uh, protect your hair from heat damage. And they just might have silicones. And the reason why you wouldn't want to use your natural hair products on that is because all natural ingredients like what we think of as natural ingredients um because that's a whole another video <laughs> but the oils and the butters and things like that they have a steam point they have a point where they actually boil and you don't want to put that in your hair when you're applying direct heat to your hair if you put coconut oil in a frying pan and heat it up to 300 degrees you know what that coconut oil is gonna do pop, pop. Pop, pop, pop. And you're putting coconut oil on your hair right before you flat iron it, sis. And guess what's happening on your strands? A pop, 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 crack, snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies, all the way down the length of your hair because you're trying to be so natural that you're damaging your locks. Don't do it, okay? Don't do it. So, depending on your desired look, what you're going for, you're gonna want to change your products, okay? Now let's do a recap because I have talked so much in this video. Number one, curl shape. It's probably the least important when it comes to determining how to take care of your hair, but use it as a tool to learn to love the way that your hair goes out of your head. Try looking at the beauty gurus out here with your natural hair texture and use them as inspiration to see your hair flourish. Strand thickness. If you have fine strands, which you probably do if you have kinky, coily, curly hair, make sure that you're using lighter products. Not a little bit of product, but lighter formulations on your hair so that you don't weigh your curls down and to really help the product sink into your strands as well. If you have medium or coarser strands, feel free to use heavier products with large concentrations of butters and oils and things like that. Density. If you have low density hair, try using less products and fewer sections when styling, cleansing, conditioning your hair. If you have very dense hair, try using more product and more sections when you're styling, cleansing, and conditioning your hair. Scalp health. Make sure that you are incorporating scalp massages into your routine to encourage circulation and blood flow to the area and to spread that natural sebum all over the surface area of your scalp. Make sure that if you have any ailments or issues pertaining to your scalp that you're addressing them in the shower with your shampoo and deep conditioner. If you have any severe ailments on your scalp, please go see a professional for those products. Porosity. If you have low porosity, unprocessed, healthy virgin hair, then that means your cuticles lay a little flatter and tighter with one another. Make sure that you're subscribed and your notifications are on so that you can see the low porosity measurement video coming up. If you have high porosity, your hair may be over processed or damaged. So your hair is extremely thirsty and tends to let the product evaporate off of the strands before you're necessarily ready. So you're gonna have to incorporate techniques into your routine where you really pack on the moisture and prevent the evaporation of that product um, over time. So make sure that you are also subscribed to see the hair um, regimen for your hair type. If you are somewhere in the middle, and you lie within the medium porosity range where your hair is not perfectly virgin but you've only applied a little bit of processing to it maybe one to three times a year then make sure you stay tuned for that video coming as well desired look the type of products that you use is going to also depend on your desired look 
If you are relaxing your hair, text laxing your hair, if you're going to be a straight natural, or if you're just straightening your hair for one time out of the year or one time out of the quarter, then the products that you use are going to change. If you're going to be doing any styles with direct heat, consider using silicones in your routine. They're going to provide a barrier from excess moisture which causes your hair to revert and also provide a plastic like layer of protection for your hair to prevent heat damage. I hope you guys found this video to be very helpful and gave you some really crucial information about building a natural hair regimen. If you have any questions about building a natural hair regimen, please leave them down below. I love answering the questions about natural hair and I am committed to taking the mystery out of natural hair care. I want you to understand what works for you. So thank you guys so much for checking in and I will catch you in the next video.